being practical in the face of so much diet tribalism is actually kind of radical, right? Like eat fruits and vegetables. It's that simple. You don't have to, they don't all have to be organic. They don't all have to be super fresh and perfect. Um, there's so much that complicates things that I was really trying to help um, almost reinvigorate uh, our, our reliance on our own common sense on kind of what we feel like is right, is reasonable, but we've been told is wrong by a million conflicting sources. Sophie Egan is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Sophie is a master of public health and is the author of How to Be a Conscious Eater. Got it right here in front of me. Fabulous read. I absolutely enjoyed every page of it. It is a page turner. And she was named one of Bon Appetit's favorite new books for climate-friendly cooking and life, and the founder of Full Table Solutions, a consulting practice that, uh, that is a catalyst for food systems transformation. She is also a contributor to the New York Times Health Section, an internationally recognized leader at the intersection of food, health, and climate. Sophie serves as Director of Strategy for Food for Climate League, co-director of the Menus of, the Ch of Change University Research Collaborative, and Senior Advisor for Sustainable Food Systems at R&D Stanford Dining. For over five years, Sophie has served as Director of Health and Sustainability Leadership Editorial Director for the Culinary Institute of America's Strategic Innovatives Group. Sophie's writing has been featured in the Washington Post, Time, Parents, The Wall Street Journal, Bon Appetit, Wired, Eating Well, Edible San Francisco, Food Tank, and Sunset out of Boulder, Colorado. Sophie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's so good to have you here that you could take the time. You're busy. Um, uh, 2019, two baby boys, twins. Uh, uh, congratulations, a little late, but uh, you're, you're besides being a uh, 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 full-time family woman, a woman of power, you're doing all sorts of stuff in the food industry. And I'm so glad you took taking the time to speak to me about your new book. It's been out for a while. You've been talking about it all over. I absolutely loved it. I just have to tell you right now, it is a, a, it is a toolkit resource bit book, super uh, graphics, super um, tips and tricks at the end of the book. It's visually stunning. And I absolutely loved it. But with all your experience, you've been doing this for a long time, as we can tell in your biography, I need to ask you the question, how in the heck hell have you weathered this crazy time, 15 plus months of Black Lives Matter, pandemic, Asian racism, inauguration, on and on and on, and a lot of things around food and, and climate as well. Um, has all that experience that you had in the in previous, your writing, your family life, given you a, a little bit of a better operating model, a system to function on in these hard times to, to, to weather the storm? Yeah, well, thank you for asking. I, I think this is a question each person is kind of grappling with as we round into to sort of transitional times and, and have this chance to reflect on how on earth did we make it through, right? Um, I'm, I'm grateful for some foundational um, routines that have pre, that predated the, the chaos because it's harder, you know, my background is in behavior change. And on the one hand, times of disruption, which the past year has been to say the least, are actually really excellent opportunities for forming new habits that can be healthy, beneficial, sustainable, um, but they can also be difficult if it's something that let's say you weren't already doing it before um it can be difficult if that's not kind of hardwired so exercise is an example where i was on the triathlon team in college 
it's a non-negotiable for me. It's like sleep. It's like, you know, drinking enough water in the day. Um, so I would talk to many people who were like, oh, I used to go to the gym and now I have to figure out how to work out at home. So I'm grateful things like that are just second nature to me. Food is like that too. You know, I really, um, in the pandemic, I really found myself just reveling in very, very simple daily routines. My one example would be my morning oatmeal. I mean, it could not be more basic, but it's the healthiest, most sustainable thing ever. And I would just sit there and savor sort of the peace and solitude of, you know, this peanut butter banana um, bowl of, of oats that, that was just nour nourishing me. It felt very stabilizing, right? There was so much instability that it's, I think we all turn to what are those sources of, of comfort, of stability, um, and of certainty. There was also just so much uncertainty um, from one day to the next. I'm a big planner. I like to look ahead and plan great trips and adventures and, and work projects. And that was also very, um, that was a major adjustment for me was to start to live very day to day, planning no longer than the end of the week. And something about that, I think really just brought a greater level of, of presence to each hour sort of throughout the day, because I wasn't, my headspace wasn't in the future as much. Um, so it was, it was an odd sort of uh, reconciliation with my work, which is so about the future, long, long future, right? Climate, um, you know, chronic disease development, things that transpire over decades. Um, but to have that, that sort of um, uh, touchstone of just a very palpable, very sensory, very boring in a way, but ultimately very stabilizing and comforting kind of daily habits. Thank you for telling us about that, because it's really, uh, we've all been struggling all around the world. Our routines have been disrupted. We're, we're uh, social distancing. We're finding new routines, building bad habits in some respects, and, and finding hopefully some new habits on cooking and, and the way we act and, and, and do things. So uh, that's perfect advice. And it's good to see that you've survived and that your family is, has made it through. And um, honestly, was, was this book launched during a pandemic? <laughs> yes, great question. So you mentioned it's been out for a while. It's interesting because uh, my pandemic story, everyone has this sort of where were you when it, the world changed, right? Um, and I was actually supposed to be on a 14 city book tour. Um, it launched March 16th of 2020. So could you pick a worse time? Um, we, my book tour was supposed to start in Seattle and that's where I'm from. And so we were actually, my family, you mentioned the twin, twin boys. It's, it's a party. Uh, they're now two and a half. So, uh, it, it's, it's real. Um, <laughs> but we had decided to move out of our house in the Bay area. We we're moving to Boulder, Colorado. And so we said, Hey, we'll go to Seattle for, you know, six weeks, park the boys with my parents while I'm jetting around to these 14 cities. We ended up living with my parents for about four months <laughs> and uh, and everything went virtual, of course. So so the book, um, it's really interesting in a way because it was, I think, more relevant than ever because people are told me, you know, I'm paying more attention to labels than I ever have. I have more time to actually study the choices, study the producers before I make these decisions, whereas so much of it before was sort of just fuel. My first book is all about um, the American food psyche and how we actually don't focus on food. Um, and so it was so interesting to have these, you know, my favorite kind of, of, of interviews as an author is live radio where you get callers and you never know what they're going to ask, um, and, or what stories they'll tell. And this, this guy in, in rural Wisconsin, um, sounded like an older gentleman. He, he called in and he said, did you know there is absolutely no oats in you know whatever cereal that was called like fruity oaty something something he's like i looked at the label and yeah, there's nowhere to be found you know and it's examples like that of you know really investigating your cheerios kind of thing um or how many grams of sugar that i think made people feel like this was actually a really really um, relevant tool i appreciate the the positive feedback um and i really started to talk about corona conscious eating too uh, I can get into kind of what that means if you'd like, but in, in the shorthand, you know, the book is a three-part decision-making guide. It is really kind of a mental checklist of 
how to navigate the bewildering world of food choices. So I suggest that to align your food choices with your values, which is my definition of conscious eating, not a diet by any stretch. It's really an intention throughout your lifetime. Um, I suggest asking yourself three questions. Is this food good for me? Is it good for others? And is it good for the planet? And during the pandemic, people would ask me, okay, how does this, what's unique about this time that relates to that? And one example was in the category of others, which I, cat I consider all the animals and people from farm to fork throughout the supply chain. I think people really started to have a greater appreciation for frontline workers as an example. Right? There were more kind of readily available um, examples, or we saw everything happening with slaughterhouse workers and thinking, oh my gosh, those are the humans who actually make my meat available, right? Um, the amazing, horrifying amounts of food loss and waste that were occurring. Um, this, these elements brought many people to these topics, and, and I'm really cautiously optimistic that, that it, it really will continue. Um, and, and there's a lot of, you know, indications that, that it will. So I bet your family is just the static, even though, oh no, the, the pandemic, you're stuck with your parents now, but I bet they're enjoying your two wonderful twin boys. And, and so a blessing in disguise, but uh, you know, it's a crazy time. There's been so many authors that I've had on the show saying launching the book during the pandemic, had it planned beforehand same stories and yet you were able to the to the power of the pivot come mm -hmm. up with a new plan a new operating system and it probably worked out better for you in, in the long run especially with the boys and the other things i i still heard about your book uh, but i my my ears to the ground always it is such a fabulous read and i really want to go deeper into it, but you tingled on your, your previous book and, and work. And I've got a copy right here, Devoured. I, I, I know you have another cover, one that's totally red. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this was the first edition or the second, uh, or yeah, if it's a, back. yeah, the, the, yeah. Okay. That's a paperback cover. Beautiful read. Absolutely loved it. I, I just need to mention it because I didn't have a po podcast back when you had this, but I would have loved to review it with you and talk to you about it because it is really a journey into the American psyche, uh, food psyche. And it is such a fabulous read. I just absolutely devoured it, read it a couple of times. Um, some things that I really had never, I mean, I, I, I'd, I'd always thought about and, and have been kind of thinking about when I talk about the innovations that have occurred since uh, the Industrial Revolution in food, there's maybe five that I can count. You know, if we push real hard, six or seven uh, really groundbreaking breaking innovations. And one of them you spent a lot of time researching was the microwave. It's supposed to make yeah. our lives simpler, reduce food waste, and give us more time. And you you devote a little section in the book about that. I absolutely love that because most people don't realize how something that really was intended to be good is, ha has a good and a bad side to it. And I love how you you talked about it and, and brought that to light. The other other two things that I really enjoyed in, in your in that book was the psychology of lines and waiting for food. And you know, it's almost like some over the years, there's like you're standing in line for Disneyland or Universal <laughs> Studios or, or or you know the to get on the Eiffel Tower in Paris, but no, you're just waiting to get a taco or, you know, uh, matter of fact, in New York is crazy. Those just those street taco vendors, you know, there'll be lines miles long, people, you know, in advance craziness. And you really talk about that and what the psychology behind it is. And then the brunches, the, the history of brunches and hotels and how that came and, and, and this is kind of a separate thing, but also the buffets that, have emerged, you know, this all you can eat and the buffet type of styles where there's are no ingredient lists. So there are no, this is made this way and this has this ingredient in it and things. And absolutely, just like the book says, I devoured it. It, it, was, it was a valuable resource. And uh, I could really tell that Michael Pollan was kind of your mentor and help in, in, over the years. Um, 
that because there's, I mean, it's just chock full of tons of other wisdom and you re, you mention and refer to them as well. So I, I wanted to thank you. I don't know if you want to tell us a little bit more about that and how how you even decided to, to go down the road to, to write that. And then we'll, I promise we're going to get on to your other book. I just, you've spent so much wonderful time doing this. We, we should address and let our, our listeners know that you, you have more than one fabulous work out there. Well, that is so kind. I really, really appreciate that. And it's fun to hear what stood out to you. It's always interesting to me to, to hear from folks. So yeah, so that book was really anthropological social science in a way. It was this, um, it, the backstory to answer your question is, I was a grad student at Cal getting my master's of public health and studying eating behavior and, and food systems. Um, and I had the amazing privilege of, of working with Michael Pollan. So I took a food writing class with him in the journalism school. And my first kind of breakthrough in as a food writer was I actually wrote the cover article for Wired Magazine's first food issue. And it was all, it was a Doritos Locos Taco. I don't know if you remember this, it was a bright neon. It's to this day, one of the best selling fast food items in American history. And I was just so baffled by its success, quite honestly, because it was coinciding with this um, narrative about Americans love of farm to table and eating clean label foods. And I thought, you know, how can these things be true simultaneously? Um, and also just, it seemed disgusting as an item. So I was sort of fascinated by the item itself. And I had the chance to go to Taco Bell headquarters in Irving, California, interview the CEO and interview the, the inventor of it, see the laboratory. Um, and I really just went way into the, the, into the weeds on, on that item. But it really um, kind of set off the course for this book because it was this truly American food phenomenon, stunt foods where it's limited time offers, it's these mashups, it's things that are so shockingly gross or bizarre that they get they get you they get you hooked. It's a very effective marketing tool. There's examples in the past like KFC's um, you know, the sandwich made out of two pieces of bread and chicken. Um, there are many many other examples in packaged foods as well. But you know, it it was this phenomenon and I thought what are the kind of collective phenomena that define American food culture. Part of this also is that I spent a lot of time, I lived in Italy uh, twice in my life, and there's such a strong food culture in many countries. Japan is another place I've just um, fallen in love with. We have these very, very strong food cultures as a country. And so often you hear America doesn't have a food culture. You know, we're this um, amalgamation of all of the food cultures of immigrant groups that have arrived over the centuries, right? Uh, and and so how do you really put your finger on it? And I was like, I want to find out what it is. So that uh, led me to really this kind of exploration of what defines how we eat and, and why in the US. Uh, and so my second year of my master's program, I had the chance to, to work under Michael Pollan in independent study, and he really helped me kind of structure the book go through that whole process. So the gist of it is how American values separate from food, which I define really kind of honed in on work and productivity, individualism and independence, freedom, and then progress, that innovation side. How those shape our eating habits in profound and often rather awful ways, um, but where there are some silver linings. And so it's everything from sad desk lunch, eating at our desks, the dismal uh, amount of time that school kids get for, for lunch, um, all the way up to Doritos, Locos, Tacos, and, and beyond. Yeah, you talk about holidays, you talk about Super Bowl, you talk about uh, events, you talk about <clears throat> Doritos, Locos, Tacos, and, and the different types and what spawned out of that and how much money was made and many, many other things. Uh, for anyone listening, I highly recommend it. It is a plethora of wisdom and knowledge and deep look and behind the scenes and into the psyche of food uh, and how and why and and also the history that really the anthropology what, what you said I absolutely loved it and I also see how the evolution is now even culminized to, to this 
we have a bunch of mutual friends. I had Eve Terrell Paul on the show and on the podcast. She's along with you in the Food for Climate League. Um, and um, also Dana Gunders, who wrote The Waste Free Kitchen and had some absolutely fabulous book and also things. And so somehow our, our paths have crossed and you're very focused in on the United States. And I'm from America. I live in Hamburg, Germany, and kind of focus a lot on Europe and Asia. And But my listeners are all, all over the world. And I really... Uh, Personally, I, I can relate to those holidays and the way the U.S. psyche works around food. It's it's just it's a total different beast. When you when I first um, moved to to Germany, uh, I brought some products from the U.S. over. I was always drinking a, a type of a green tea, and so I brought some of those with me. And I'd let other people try, or they'd ask me what I was always drinking, and. And they're like, oh, that's too sweet. I can't drink it. That's way too sweet. And the taste buds here are much different. The palate's different. The sweetness level is much different. And now I think we're going on 11 or 12 years that I've been here uh, full time. Um, and every time I go back to visit family or go back to, to the States, um, I, I have the same type of experience when I eat the breads, when I eat the, the products that are made for me, even with, with my family, they're so sweet. I mean, even the, co the coffees are just unbelievable. I just, it's a different palate that you build and changes over time. And I really like how in through your first book and, and that you kind of, you, you say how the Americans are a little bit different in, in the food culture and how that's evolved. Your your new book, you really, um, and, I, and I think we've touched upon enough of the other stuff that we can go into it, but you really go into a bunch of different things. So it's, I just want four different parts in this book, uh, stuff that comes from the ground, stuff that comes from animals, stuff that comes from factories, and stuff that is made uh, in restaurants and kitchens. And then you really, as you just uh, said earlier, before I went back to your other book, is you really ask those three questions, the three criteria, is it good for me? Is it good for others? Is it good for the planet? And I love that because you really tie in the importance of, of sustainability and on our planet and long-term things. But you also break it down. How do we how do we influence and change this system of highly processed food in, in some respects? How do we get, uh, is it made in a factory? Why is it made? How can we change that system? Have we been, become reliant upon factory food? And um, I, I don't, I didn't have any of the, the pages bookmarked so I could show, but I mean, this is an audio podcast, but there's just fabulous visuals. And at the end of each section, you go through and give not only tips and tricks, kind of of the five takeaways, so to say, and, and uh, uh, or the takeaways from that section. Easy to read, beautiful to read, but also it's very powerful to give you that knowledge that you need when you go to a grocery store, when you're looking at products, before you get to cooking, uh, also when you go out and eat. And... Um, I, I don't want to give it all away, but I'm just telling you, I, I read it. I, I loved it. I, besides Dana's book and maybe one or two others, I haven't found such a plethora of resources mm -hmm. that people can use in their daily lives because we're overwhelmed. We're like, what do we do? There's so many choices. And you do talk about choices as well. Um, so I, I, I guess I, I just really want to start out first um, and say, have I surmised it good enough for you? And what what were the real, besides what we've already touched upon, some things for you now that it's been out a while and you've been speaking about it, that is coming back as, as resonance during the pandemic that people say, wow, this book really is uh, showing me a different world that I didn't know. Just some takeaways that you've seen and feedback. Yeah, well, well, thank you. I think you summarized it beautifully. Um, I think one of the big pieces is actually about sugar. It's interesting that you commented on that. 
Um, I have a section in my first book about the desertification, as in desert, or as in dessert, not desert, um, of breakfast and how there are so many foods in um, the American marketplace, right, just the food supply, that really should be categorized as dessert um, for the pure amount of sugar. Coffee is another great example. Um, breads, even, um, soups, sauces, things that really, you know, when you look at it, it's like, is that where you want to be blowing your sugar budget? Um, and it is that sort of retraining that's needed of our palates. The same is true on the sodium side. Um, the level of saltiness, the sort of ex expectation for flavor that sadly begins really in infancy um, and, and early childhood. I've been so disturbed to read the number of, you know, children in the U.S. who are like pre-diabetic um, and who totally exceed sodium levels at age one or two, right? So I, I really definitely have heard from people how much just the bottom line facts about sugar are helpful because it's something that people really are, I think there's been a um, among the many, many topics, that's one where there's been quite a bit of consciousness raising in the US. Documentaries like Fed Up, for instance, have helped kind of raise that on the national uh, scene. And so you'd hear from people like, well, I used to think this or I've heard that. And one of the, the kind of pieces I'll add to your summary of the book is that it's meant to be the bottom line answers to the most top of mind questions about what on earth to eat, because there's so much decision fatigue, information overload, but also misinformation and disinformation. And I'm glad you mentioned the, rep the resources that I pulled together because a big part of the service of this book and, and really my intention was to scan the evidence base and say, okay, this is the tiebreaker. <laughs> if your Facebook friend or your neighbor or your cousin is telling you, you know, this or that diet, or I tried this and this worked great. There's so much diet evangelism as I described in Devoured that people really are not making fact-based decisions. And so I also call this book radically practical in the sense that being practical in the face of so much diet tribalism is actually kind of radical, right? Like eat fruits and vegetables. It's that simple. You don't have to, they don't all have to be organic. They don't all have to be super fresh and perfect. Um, there's so much that complicates things that I was really trying to help um, almost reinvigorate uh, our, our reliance on our own common sense, on kind of what we feel like is right, is reasonable, but we've been told is wrong by a million conflicting sources, right? You can search the internet for and get any answer. <laughs> uh, so part of this is really just saying, here's what the evidence base, the science actually tells us, and therefore what you should do about it. And, and sugar is, is one example. But in terms of what has really resonated with people, I think it's two main things. One is around plant-based versus plant-forward, plant-centric, flexitarian eating. When you talk about how to eat at the intersection of human and environmental health, one of the biggest ways, very simply, is to emphasize foods from the plant kingdom. That's why that's the first section of the book. It's the stuff that comes from the ground that should make up the bulk of your, of your diet. But there's a lot that makes people think, and this is related to Food for Climate Lee, what you alluded to, that the only way to eat for climate friendly is to go full vegan. You must completely exclude plant-based foods. And there's such a narrative, especially um, in, in food around all or nothing, right? Like um, you're in or you're out, in group, out group. And I really was trying to, in this with this book say, you can eat in ways that are good for your health and that of the planet, just by the ratios, emphasis, um, plant forward, plant centric, plant rich, whatever you want to call it. And that felt, I think, very relieving to people. Oh my God, I don't have to go completely vegan in order to optimize my health and that of the planet. Like, thank goodness, right? Because it's, it's felt very exclusionary in that way. Um, the other big one, I think, is around the holistic nature of the book. So it's those three questions, which are I think of as apertures, right? Like if you can see the world with a set of three lenses simultaneously, because there's so much um, siloed thinking, you know, I'm all about animal welfare, therefore I'm, I'm vegan, or I'm all about, you know, my nutrient density, and therefore I actually, you know, really count my calories and I, I'm using tons of single use or um, uh, single portion foods, tons of wrappers, packaging, not at all paying attention to the environment. So I was really trying to help people see the interconnections and also just um, 
add some lenses to the 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 ways that they're they're evaluating foods and i think that was also especially again nuance is not something that is always easy to deal with that was refreshing for many people yeah i mean you really need that balance everything in a balance and not this extreme one way or the other um i i been a global food reformist or talking about global food systems reform or transformation uh, for many years and, and speaking about food. I come from a long history of uh, organic farmers in, in Europe and um, really been involved in that for a while, as well as climate and environmentalism and that type of thing. And, and the minute people hear that, they're automatically marks a vegan, and it's all this extreme, and there's there's these things that come out, and um, it's not always life doesn't work always in an all or nothing or a siloed linear lateral approach. It's very complex, many systems, and it's different all for for each gender and age and and place that we live in the world. It's it's very different. Um, some places in the world don't have a lot of processed foods and other places have tons and, and a lot of, you know, different types of choices. So I, I really liked how you address that in the book. And it's really, you, you, you give the choice back, you give the, the, not even choice, the suggestions or the, the, ed, the education or the, the tools there so that they can say, Oh, how can I improve my situation? Do it for what I like and eat how I like but still be good for my health and the planet and for others. And I really, I absolutely love that. You, you also <clears throat> kind of tingle on some things that Michael Poland said as well, as far as the balance goes as well, his famous, his famous words. I always say, and, and I kind of maybe want to get into this a little bit more, is that it's really not about the brands of the future or the food products of the future or the future of food in that respect. It's more about how we produce food that will have the biggest impact on human suffering, human health, and, and our environment. If we produce food without aromas, flavors, sugars, additives, preservatives, chemicals, pesticides, what, you know, whatever else, and without in that process, a lot of waste, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, a lot of uh, external externalities, um, it's really hard to make a bad product. You know, there's, it's really hard to say, okay, it's all these blue dyes and these lists of ingredients you've never heard of. Um, plus in the process, the, the planet doesn't suffer on long transportation ways or the way it's produced and, and, um, that creates emissions or some kind of a waste that comes back to bite us. Um, exponentially. And so I, I don't know how much you agree with that line of yeah. thought and, and how would you phrase that in your words on processing food or factory food? I completely agree with you. And it's interesting because there's actually, so humans are looking for mental shortcuts, right? Again, the world is complex, information overload. We all have a lot of busy lives and, and it's difficult. And so I don't think that's going to go away. But what can happen is that we either oversimplify um, at the at the detriment of all these other things you mentioned in the you know other examples of technologies where there's actually unintended consequences. I would say that one unintended consequence of the focus on local food is that people have reduced climate smart eating to food miles. When you actually look at the breakdown, the pie chart of emissions from food, transportation is about five percent production is like 60 to 70 percent and i really think there needs to be greater attention to it's not only the processing but you mentioned your your family history which is really interesting how was it grown what state is the soil in as a result um what is the impact on surrounding wildlife and ecosystems right and so it's the entire process from seed to, to the packaging. And, and people often also forget about what happens afterward, right? The downstream effects. Is it compostable? Does it come in a wrapper that's compostable? I really love, you, meant, um, you know, there's Ellen MacArthur Foundation and others who are working on this idea of circular economy. Um, it's a wonky term and, and I can talk about why for many eaters right now, that's like, what on earth are you talking about? But in principle, it's just this idea that 
could we have kind of back to nature, everything in a cycle as opposed to um, extraction to, you know, waste, right? Um, so it's, I definitely agree with you that there, there, that is far more important. I'll give some examples just briefly. One of my favorite things in, in general, I mentioned my oatmeal is I'm kind of a whole grains fanatic and I think they're really underappreciated. Um, but one of the craziest things that happens to me that happens in, in my perspective, it doesn't happen to me is how so many food products start with a whole grain kernel that is perfect, right? Nature's beautiful package, the germ, the brand, um, and the endosperm, and it's stripped of its most beneficial parts, which by the way now is a huge food waste crisis. There's a fantastic um, uh, scientist named, named Stephen Jones from the Bread Lab at Washington State University. You should have him on your podcast. He's brilliant and fascinating. I'll look him up. Um, yeah, so he, um, he has really kind of started to raise this point that not only is that so stupid nutritionally, but it's a huge food waste problem, right? Um, and sometimes it's going to animal feed or, or whatnot. But what happens is that now you have the least nutritious part that gets manipulated, bleached, turned into whatever horrible thing it's going to become, has all kinds of stuff added to it. And then sometimes the manufacturer will actually add back in a form of fiber um, and say, you know, that it's that it, you know, as a value add. So it's now sort of inferior to how it began um, and plus has a bunch of weird new things. Uh, so that's just an example where if we can really start to look at uh, how do you kind of undo some of those, those systems and, and processes. And, and it doesn't mean, look, I don't believe that people are going to only eat whole foods forever. I, that's great if you can do that for the bulk of your diet. Um, but I get that there's going to be obviously a role um, but I'm, a, I'm heartened by at least things like upcycled foods. The new upcycled foods association and certification is really fueling more of these kinds of products that start with byproducts as an example, and especially when they can also reclaim some of the nutritional value that's just totally being wasted at the same time that we have these other, you know, human and environmental health crises. Absolutely. I mean, Dana talks about that a little bit in her book as well. So how, what can you do to avoid that waste-free kitchen? And, and, and uh, there's so many tools and tricks out there to do that. It's also that psyche of convenience. Do we have the time? You, you and, and Devoured, you talk a lot about we're eating at work. If, if we had reduced working hours and, and there wasn't this extreme pressure, then we wouldn't eat while we're working or in front of the computer or one handed, which right. also has a huge effect on how we eat and how what we eat, because it's about convenience quick. And it's it's not this, you know, e even though uh, we've we've all spoken and been involved in many different e eating conventions and organizations where they're saying slow food and, and you know, family, uh, food is how family and culture gather and there's this exchange. Yes, to, to some extent, but there's also, as you have you shown from your studies and research that that used to be the case and it's kind of changed over the years, especially as we've had technology and cell phones and other things that are just kind of taking us away from that reality. Um, and especially in the holidays, like you mentioned, the Super Bowl and Thanksgiving and some things that where it's really not the focus around the dinner table, it's more around the TV or some other type of a way of doing it. So I, I, I absolutely love that. There is some kind of questions along that lines of processed food, factory foods and things that I want to see what your experiences are. And I'm not sure that I totally read it. It's not part, part of your book, but I, I want to ask your opinions and advice. You, you do consulting. So if anybody wants to know, I'm stealing some free consulting and giving you that. <laughs> um, uh, there's a, in the climate arena, and, and this is another thing that, that I really need to say about you. In 2018, you completed this ex executive education for sustainability leadership program at Harvard Center for Climate and Health. 
and the global environment. And you're really big about the, the, the state of our planet and health and environment and how, how to incline it. And you're probably still learning, but I'm, I'm the same way. And so I also think that in food for a long time, there's been this big mess of uh, natural capital, true cost of, of the products, the, the harvest time, the labor time, the transport time, the water, the energy that goes in to produce that. And, and I'll give you an example. I, I love cashews and I love avocados and I love mangoes. And in Germany, they don't exist. So they come from Vietnam, they come from Thailand, uh, thousands of kilometers away, thousands of miles away for our American friends listening. Uh, and they're, then they're sold in the grocery stores here, even in a whole foods or natural uh, um, um, organic store or grocery store, they would sell them for, you know, a mango for one euro or uh, maximum two euros or a whole bag of cashews that are salted and roasted for a euro 50. And there's no way that the embedded water, the transport, the packaging, the logistics. And so we've seen more of this um, white labels, no name brands, and also in, uh, since 2008, when we had the financial crisis and all food systems kind of went into a commodity thing, that the natural capital and the true cost of food is totally disappearing out of those products. And there's not a lot of thought or ethics or consciousness when people say, oh yeah, I'm so glad that's a euro 50 for a bag of cashews and you pop it in your mouth and you've just eaten a tree, a half, tree and a half of cashews, right? Uh, uh, so I kind of like to get your thoughts and feelings on how you've dealt with that and, and maybe where there's some places in the book, if you've tickled upon that or if that's a, a whole deeper subject. Oh, it's a big, it's a deeper subject for sure, but I, I definitely have a lot of thoughts on it. And, and it's interesting that you ask uh, in terms of the timing, because just at the start of this year, I actually started to co-lead a working group on true cost accounting, uh, true cost of food. There's many different terms for it, real cost of food. Um, that's part of the Google Food Lab. And I have the, the pleasure of, of co-leading this with an amazing, amazing food systems leader named Mara Fleischman, who's the CEO of Chef Ann Foundation, another person you should have on your podcast. And we're really trying to figure out how to accelerate, I don't love the term consumer, but eater awareness, citizen awareness, policymaker awareness, um, and also buy-in on the business side to really stop skirting this issue. Because what you spoke of is dead on. There is a long-rooted, artificially low-priced uh, system to food. One of my main examples that I give for that is the dollar menu at many fast food chains. I mean, how on earth a hamburger can cost $1 should really make you wonder how were the workers treated? How was the animal treated? What was it fed? Um, how was it cooked or put together that in any possible realm of reality made it cost $1? Right. And there are many examples, like you said, that really what's happens. And I think that the, the most powerful framing that I've seen so far about this is to demonstrate where those costs actually do show up. So they're not being owned by the company. They're not being paid by you, the person buying it. Where do they go? And so there's a, there are some, some organizations starting to capture this and it's fascinating, right? I mean, the biggest one is healthcare costs because all that crap produces a lot of disease um, that winds up costing, you know, in the US, we have the highest healthcare costs imaginable. That's definitely its own topic. Um, but then there are ecosystem impacts, right? You have to deal with the damage that's being done. Someone has to clean that up, right? The, the water quality, perhaps, from, let's say, CAFOs, confined animal feeding operations, uh, and the, the sludge that might be emerging from that. You have air quality impacts. Some of that goes into healthcare costs, asthma and so forth. Some of that goes into um, environmental costs, but just really trying to capture and make visible those externalities that you spoke about. So I would say that it's an incredibly important topic. It's still very early days. I 
at for sure from a, a kind of eater or, or public awareness standpoint. One of the things we're talking about is even how to talk about it, because I think true cost accounting, for example, is a very wonky description that's not going to get it's not going to rocket this into pop culture. Um, and so instead, it's, you know, it's really trying to say, how do we make this palpable and feel relevant to you as the eater? Because one of the important considerations is equity. And we cannot have a situation where it's like, okay, we're going to start reflecting the true cost of this food. And now all of your foods are going to cost six times what they cost now. And how on earth are low income people going to eat real food, right? How are they going to eat the foods that are now the, the better foods that are priced accordingly, all the worst foods are still going to, right? That's how is that going to end up in a situation where everyone has access? Um, so we have to do so in a way that leaves no one behind. And this is another really big ch challenge as you start to look towards that, because what we don't want is the, the situation where, um, again, sort of it's, it's only available to the elite. Um, and this is a really big part of, of what the Food for Climate League is all about, is democratizing sustainable eating. A big piece of that, we focus on narrative, how to talk about it. That's why language is, is something that I'm especially focused on. Um, but in the case of the true cost of food, the actual costs have to also change before the narrative um, can even be applied. You're, you're also part of, or your company is uh, food, Table solutions and okay, it's a consult, uh, consulting practice that basically is a catalyst for food system transformation. And so you consult a lot of people and have portfolios sent around defining decade projects and, and concerted effort to address urgent need, especially towards this climate action by 2030. Um, that leads me to a, a couple of things that also tie to the book. Really in 2020, we started the UN, uh, Antonio Guterres started the UN Food System Summit because of that, we, we, 2020, we really couldn't do anything. Now we're starting to realize this year, the food systems dialogues, we're having the pre-meeting soon in, in Rome, uh, the pre-summit in Rome at the FAO, and then we'll have, and hopefully in September, uh, uh, keep our fingers crossed, we'll have the actual physical hybrid event of the UN Food System Summit there. The topic, the, the, the theme around food and how it affects human health, human suffering and our environment is to the forefront. It's risen to the top. It's the number one thing. It's the biggest way as Paul Hawken would say and, and many others who speak about this, the biggest way to draw down the problems that we're having in, in our world. And I know you've been involved with this. So you started out, um, with the eat form this year online you did a talk with uh with them online and and, mm -hmm. and uh, touched upon your book but upon other things and and the eat form came out with the eat lancet report and and uh food in the anthropocene and, and basic things and so i i just want to know kind of going forward what are the tools and tips and tricks things that you've been talking about and, and what what is your view of why we really need to find some urgency around reaching some of the goals and targets in 2030 and how that ties to your book and also the other work that that i see you doing around the globe on and offline uh, for, yeah. for this well thank you yeah so i won't bore everyone with all the stats um of the climate science but the the gist of it is that there's broad consensus that 2030 is kind of this tipping point, this uh, deadline, if you will. I'm a writer, I'm deadline driven, um, that we have to avoid the worst effects of climate change. We already see awful effects of climate change around the globe all the time, right? Climate change is not a hypothetical future state. It's here at our doorsteps and it's real. So really, it's up to us to achieve drawdown, as you said, which is the point at which emissions stop rising and eventually start decreasing. So we have this time sensitivity. In my realm, what I've seen is just often overlooking the powerful role of food as a tool for climate action. Project Drawdown is one of my guiding lights um, because they have this amazing list of the top 80 plus, it's growing, uh, solutions for reversing global warming. Number one on their list is reducing food waste. 
wow, right? I mean, this beats out uh, the usual suspects in energy and transportation, things that most commonly are associated with the tools in our toolkit, the areas of investment, where we should be focusing our time, energy, policy. Number three on their list is plant-rich diets. To me, this is so exciting because I've been working on food waste and plant-rich diets for years. Um, and it just was wind at our backs to double down and to accelerate. Part of why I designed my, full, my consulting practice in the way that I have is I've seen so much great work among countless organizations who are trying um, each in their own way to, to tackle a piece of this, right? At the intersection of, of food, health, and climate. But most often it's not coordinated, it's not measured, the impact of the things that they're doing are not measured, and it's not moving fast enough. And so my goal is not to invent a new solution. It's actually just to propel the solutions that we know we have at our fingertips in principle, in practice to propel those forward, to get more companies, more uh, governments, more NGOs, more developers, more any stakeholders relevant, eaters, um, embracing them so that we have this, this chance to really use the tools that are at our disposal. So some of the ways that I do that, one really strong example is the Menus of Change University Research Collaborative. So this is an incredibly exciting consortium, global network of 60 plus colleges and universities all around the world. Uh, we bring together chefs, dining directors, academic researchers, senior university administrators, and other food leaders from universities, as well as uh, other research collaborator kind of organizations, NGOs, including EAT that you mentioned. And we use campus dining halls as living laboratories to understand how do you get people to waste less food? How do you get folks super excited to eat plant forward uh, and, and so forth related to, to healthier, more sustainable ways of eating. And what we've done recently, uh, really over the past four years, is embraced our collective purchasing power. So we have an initiative called the Collective Impact Initiative that takes this concept from Stanford Social Innovation Review. The, the organization is led, co-founded by the Culinary Institute of America in Stanford. And I'm the co-director alongside Eric Montel, who's the executive director of Stanford Dining. And this collective impact initiative is really embracing the power of collective target setting. So, so often we have pledges from individual companies, individual uh, city governments, and it's really saying when we all work together towards, we have a shared goal of 25% reduction of food related emissions by 2030, each institution, we have Kansas State University in the heart of cattle country, they may move a little bit slower than, you know, Cal, my, my alma mater, right? The Berkeley kind of hub of the food movement. Um, but we're all moving in the same direction and sharing learnings about what works to shift our protein portfolios to reduce emissions. So I really think that there's in particular, need for shared metrics, shared um, data sharing in general, um, and understanding more on an open source level versus here, I'm my company with my secret roadmap to net zero, um, and more of a collective approach to this effort that I think is one tool that can really help accelerate. There are many others, the narrative is a big one, um, but those are some, some of the examples. I'll just close with, Cross-sector learnings is another super important tool that's often under, underutilized. Stanford Dining, we actually just joined Drawdown Labs, which is Project Drawdown's um, consortium of bold climate leaders from mostly private sector companies who are working together to scale climate solutions. And what's so exciting about that group is it brings together, you know, Allbirds Fashion, for example, with CPG, Impossible, with um, tech companies like Google and Intuit, with us, we're a university, and we're really now able to do kind of what I was describing on the collective impact, but cross-sectorally. All of this in turn, I have tremendous optimism and energy um, just by the possibilities of, of what's been sort of untapped or, or undertapped uh, as far as the tools we have available. I, I love it. That is such a, a heartwarming. I, I don't know if you know, uh, Paul Hawkins coming out with a new book in September. It's called Regeneration. Oh, and awesome. I'm so excited for it. Yeah. And, um, I've had a, a couple of the researchers. Uh, Eric uh, Tonsmeyer was, he did the Carbon Farming Solution book, and he also wrote the big sections around farming and permaculture and regenerative agriculture in the drawdown and was one of the researchers in there as well. And so I've had him on the podcast and I absolutely 
just love those thinking about the the drawdown project and and uh, I, I guess the drawdown labs is part of the NCSE drawdown project labs something it's a, a climate based science um, project is very fabulous so I'm excited to hear you're involved with that and and thanks for kind of going deeper and giving us that insight because it's so important. The, the real crux of it all is I want to ask in, in, in simple terms, what's your, what's your best advice? How do, how do we become a conscious eater? Yeah, so the way I have started to think about introducing this to people over time, you mentioned, you know, now that it's sort of the benefit of, of time, it's been out in the world for a year. The audio book just came out, um, read by yours truly. Um, I really I, started can I say something that I actually wanted to mention that as well. So I highly recommend everybody get the get each of the books devoured and this book because they're a great reference resource book to, to you'll probably be going back and looking at them tons of times. But both of her books are on audio and she reads them and they are beautiful if you can tell from her wonderful voice. So thanks, Sophie. But sorry to interrupt. Yeah, well, thank you. No, I know this is a podcast. So I had to mention it. Um, it's on Audible. <laughs> but that's true. Conscious Eater, for sure, has such spectacular visuals. So so hopefully kind of a, a mix of, of, of both. And I have to give tremendous kudos to Iris Gottlieb, who is the incredibly talented illustrator uh, in Conscious Eater. Um, but yeah, so I, I think what I've started to really do is situate the advice in conscious eater within a very wonky uh, framework for behavior change and systems change. And it's called social ecological model. If you've ever come across this, it doesn't matter what that academic model is. The point is to think of the different levels or different levers um, of influence that you have. So I am an individual. I put food in my body. I need to make choices that align with my personal values that leave the least imprint on the people and planet uh, that optimize my own health. But I'm also a mother and I feed my husband <laughs> and I have to think about it on a household level and the collective footprint of now the four of us, right? Then I have my immediate neighborhood community level. I may want to in influence um, the school that my children eventually go to. The institutions that are in my community and neighborhood have huge purchasing power um, and volume just of the total footprint that they, uh, that they have through purchasing and then also on the populations that they serve. Then there's just these concentric circles, right? And it grows from there um, to the state, regional, national, and ultimately policy level. So my ultimate goal is that people really practice, get in the habit, get some small wins with Conscious Eater, okay? Something so simple like, ugh, I feel like I should probably stop having toast with butter every morning. Okay, try out peanut butter instead. Or let's say you eat a sandwich with turkey and cheese every day for lunch. Maybe you try with hummus and avocado. You get a positive feedback loop. That actually wasn't bad. I felt great afterward. It saved me money. It tasted awesome. It snowballs from there when you have um, these small cycles, again, feedback loops that then become just the defaults in your life. And you don't have to invest the mental energy once you've already invested in each of those changes. And I really encourage people on the individual level to focus on your routinized habits, the, your coffee ritual. What do you eat every weekday for lunch? Not what do you eat on your birthday or on vacation or you know, on a special date night surprise, uh, you know, special celebration because of the total impact that those routinized habits have is way greater on your health and on the planet. Then once you have that kind of empowerment and, and really the knowledge base and, and, and evidence base, use your voice, vote with your grocery basket, vote with your vote also um, to really advocate for the same kind of framework at those other levels, at your community level, the institutions, do you have an employer? What is their food program? Um, at schools, again, colleges and universities, um, and ultimately at the policy level. Um, there may become, or you can help bring about uh, legislation that can make a huge difference. And I allude to some of that in the book. Food waste is one example. Date labels is like 
the craziest thing we have of, you know, best buy, best before, all these very confusing labels. You can vote, call your Congress people um, and, and express your support of things once you have that sense uh, of what are the general production methods, the general types of foods that are gonna really support that intersection of what's good for us, others in the planet. So both your books were really America-based. So a lot of America research study, which is fine, but I have a, a kind of a global question for you. Do you feel like a global citizen and how would you feel about the removal of all borders, walls and limitations, humanity one from another? And what's your view on your understanding of this, and especially with the lens of food? That's a fascinating question. I can tell you I've never been asked that. I don't think I personally feel, well, I do and I don't in, feel like a global citizen. Uh, uh, the pandemic has changed this in a way, right? Because we've really, each of us, I think, gone deep into our immediate surroundings. Um, but then because of everything being virtual, we are also in places we never were before. We're interacting with people across every time zone imaginable. So it's, in, it's an odd thing where in my mind, in the ether, <laughs> internet world, I absolutely feel like a global citizen. But in my 3D body, I feel so deeply attuned to my immediate surroundings, to you know the mountain air, to the spectacular um, you know plants that are appearing that are driving allergies crazy. Um, and and in those ways, it feels very. It's both like there's a great term called global which is yeah. global and local, right? And, and I also feel that sense of, I'm just so eager to connect with my next door neighbors, right? Or, or the producers um, that are a bike ride away uh, from me. So I, I really have been pleased with how virtual engagements, you mentioned the UN Food System Summit, and I've been so delighted by the ways that I can participate in things I never could have traveled to physically before. And, you know, many of us will rethink, should we be traveling to those for the, you know, the um, air travel emissions? Um, but I'm having dialogues with people across the entire world. And that is a really good outcome, I feel. Um, should we dissolve all borders in the, for the sake of food, I think is the, the second part of the question. Ooh, that's a tough one. I don't know if I have a good answer. I think the main thing I would say is that there's a great tagline from a sweatshirt I have from a, I gave a book talk at Northeastern University. And the, the sweatshirt says, food is the universal language. And that I 1000% agree with. Uh, I do really feel, you know, there's other terms like if you, um, if you want to understand someone, eat their food. Um, and, and there's so many things about that that are so true. It's, it's a powerful tool for diplomacy. I've been admiring programs that, you know, send chefs abroad to, to broker peace deals and, and so forth. Um, so I think it's one of our best uh, vehicles for global community, for understanding um, across borders, across languages, religions. Uh, and, and it has, it's hard to think of something that could beat it. For, for that potential of, of, of kind of dissolving barriers, overcoming um, those differences. Geopolitically, I don't know if I can say we completely get rid of borders, but I'm excited for sure about, um, you know, again, even the power of the internet to share food ways, to share food knowledge, to share trends, um, and, and to help us feel connected to people who in your 3D body you don't interact with, but who you start to feel a sense of connection with because you understand their food. Thank you for, for addressing that. The reason, just so you know, and uh, the reason I ask is because during this crazy time of the pandemic and lockdown and social distancing, really air, water, food have all been global citizens. The pandemic was a global citizen. Species have been a global citizen. Uh, we're breathing the same air that Gandhi or Caesar or um, Plato, Socrates were, were breathing. It's just been regenerated few million billion times more the same water uh, as well 
there, you know, that goes back to the waste. There is no throw away on this planet Earth. We're all crew members of this, this grand spaceship Earth. Um, and and uh, it's kind of interesting to, to see those in, in Europe and especially in Germany, there's been a couple of grocery store chains that in local, um, local hubs or local areas, they've taken all, all of the non-local foods off the shelves to show the customers what it would be like to not have food or the diversity of other foods from other places that weren't locally grown and, and harvested and produced um, uh, off of the shelves. And it's been a grand experiment of how global our world is and how global food is. And, um, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, you've been a lot to Italy. I don't know if you ever dealt with this, but it's probably been since uh, 2010, even stronger. Majority of the tomato sauce for pizzas and sauce comes from China for, for Italy, you know, um, and then some very fancy restaurants, some very fancy producers will We'll do local stuff or get stuff from Greece, and uh, but the majority of tomatoes, tomato sauce, and paste comes from China. And if you know it, Italians like I do, and they really knew that they would pull out their hair, they would be embarrassed because of their strong pride in in, in their cuisines. And so um, this time has also driven a lot of nationalism in this uh, around the world, and food has really been. The sufferer in, in some respects. I don't know if uh, you, you know how much food was not harvested and, and went to waste because we didn't have the migrant laborers who, who ha could harvest it. We didn't have enough people to, to produce it. And right. then that doesn't even go to say all the, in Germany, we had a big problem in the chicken and meat processing areas uh, during the pandemic. Uh, all sorts of abhorrent conditions and in the U.S. as well, mm -hmm. that um, these times where we have pandemics or catastrophes or energy crises or financial crisis, where our basic resource, which is food, our en basic energy source in this world, where those really the problems, these global problems and the systems are really the cracks in the system, I guess, really shine to light. And so that's kind of how, why I asked you that question to kind of see your feeling and, and, and the bigger perspective. But I believe you answered it absolutely beautifully. And uh, thank you about that. I always nice to see another perspective. The, the hardest question that I have for you today is really the burning question, WTF. And most people are like, the swear word? No, it's not the swear word. Although probably in the past 15 months, you, you have said this, especially when you're like, oh, now we're going to be with my parents and the kids or, or whatever. Somehow you, 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 you might have said that with all the craziness going in on our world. Um, but it's what's the future? And kind of your vision, your lens for you, what's the future, uh, especially since your company is to consulting is to 2030. So give us that vision. Yeah, absolutely. So a couple of things. One is currently why I even had to write how to be a conscious eater is that the marketplace is set up so that if you want to eat in ways that are best for you, others in the planet, you really have to go out of your way. You are like a salmon swimming upstream. The future, my hope, true belief, is that the defaults will be that way. The marketplace will shift, consumer signals will shift, the urgency of climate change will require from a production perspective these shifts so that the food environments that we inhabit globally won't feel as much like you are that kind of going against the counter forces and having to sleuth out the options that are better. Uh, I describe, you know, at the end of the book, we, you won't call it conscious eating, you'll just call it eating and it will be inherently conscious. Why do I think that's possible is because every year there's been greater demands collectively for transparency, traceability, accountability. You mentioned true costing is going to absolutely kind of start to enter that. And the level of granularity 
not only who made my food, but how, from where exactly. I only see that going more, um, more precise through you know, the many technological tools that are enabling this, AI, machine learning, right? Um, and also just through that cultural, uh, the cultural winds that, that propel it forward. The other thing I think is, is the, the mirror of that is that climate smart eating will become the norm. Um, sustainable eating will be just, it won't be the niche as it's long been, uh, where it's sort of only for, you know, the people who can afford it or only for uh, people who, you know, are tree huggers or whatever, um, it will again just be the defaults. It will be, um, it will be the, the defining elements of food culture, again, because it must, <laughs> um, but also because the, the options available will increase, right, uh, to, the, to the counterpart on, I always think of my work as both consumption and production top-down, bottom-up uh, transformation of the food system. And the other major element I see in the future that's part of this, both for uh, our health and, and planetary health, is a dramatic increase in the diversity, the biodiversity of foods that we eat. So maybe Eve Thoreau Paul or others who come on your podcast have spoken about this crazy situation where something like 75% of what we eat comes from 12 species, uh, you know, 12 plants and five animals, something like that. Um, and it's awfully boring, right? When you really start to look at it that way. Um, and from the, the perspective of resilience, um, from the perspective of cultural diversity um, and um, culturally relevant diets, there's so many reasons, so many um, sort of confluences that point us towards a future where our diets, our plates are just comprised of a much greater um, range of foods. And we're gonna really look back and say, how lame was that? How narrow? Um, and, and, and just the, um, the explosion, I think, of, of kind of reconnecting with the hundreds of thousands of species that are available, um, but just have yet to, to sort of be re, um, rediscovered. Uh, they're not new. They're and uh, they're really just um, been sh pushed to the margins for all the reasons we've talked about in the name of um, you know homogenization um, and convenience and and all these other drivers that I really believe will become or hope and believe will become less important so that other things can become more important um, and hopefully those other things will be all the parts that I talk about in the book right. Um, Absolutely. Our own, our own health and and social welfare, animal welfare, uh, and and planetary health above all. I absolutely agree with you, and I think that not only will it happen, it's just a better operating system. It's a better model, not only for those those past factories of food or the high processed food producers. They'll realize that there are some better models there with better diversity, better products uh, for customer residents. And, and for that, that not, are not only better long-term for business and they're not uh, at the cost of finite resources or human health and the ripple effects are up, but that it's um, one that eventually that, that uh, consciousness and that shift will change in such a way that we will hopefully have to spend less time looking at labels and ingredients lists because there will be better processes, better producers of food and um, more whole foods, more clean foods, more ones where the labelings is, is not the factor you can say, ah, I trust or I can, I, I don't even have to look because I can rest assured that the, the, the food systems have slowly begun to change the way we we look at the world and food and, and that diversity comes back. Um, mm -hmm. that, that is there, I, I really think, see that as well. This is kind of similar to the, the future question. It's a little bit different. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Yeah, it's interesting. I've, I've facilitated ideations like this. And it's very hard to say, kind of to your earlier question about global, local, it's very hard for people to describe this as a globe. 
I mean, you can kind of get the view from space, right? You, I even have a children's book for my, my boys that's about climate superheroes. And it, it shows how the earth went, you know, was sick, went to the doctor, got diagnosed, and then it basically got a giant bath and came out clean and better and healthy and happy. <laughs> and so the, the view from space is that animals are thriving, plants are thriving, waters are clean, oceans, right? So it's all in balance, you know, and, and of course there's the term planetary boundaries, those aren't being exceeded and so forth. Um, the air is clean and pure. It's like those ads for allergy medication where you peel it back, you know, the Claritin, it's like um, gray and murky and then you peel it back and it's like you're seeing through contact lenses for the first time. Um, so that's all like as a, as a whole, the planetary system. But what that means in terms of day-to-day -day life for humans, it's easier, I think, to think about on your neighborhood scale. And it's really, it's really these kind of utopian visions that kind of started to appear during the pandemic in many ways. It's people slowing down, eating at a table, cooking way more than they ever did, growing way more food than they ever did. It's uh, using, as opposed to, Michael, you mentioned Michael Pollan, he has a great book, uh, one of his earliest, that was all about how stupid it is to have lawns. And you can really imagine that people start to just totally change how they use their space, right? Everywhere can be a vertical garden, it can be an herb garden, it can be a chicken coop. Um, a lot of communal food sovereignty that way. Uh, a lot of just time spent outdoors. Um, and a part of that, you know, there's, there's ideas such as like universal wages, um, which could even more bring this about because one of the biggest crises on the level of good for others is really about how food workers are paid um, and, and, you know, restaurant workers and, and, and tipping and so forth, factory farm, food, uh, farm workers, the whole range. But if you imagine that everyone is, has a basic income level that secures their core human needs of housing, um, and, and so forth, sufficient nutritious food, then there is that utopian vision that can be possible. Um, that's not only for the people currently who have enough income to make all those things possible. So there's policy changes that will have led to that being, being possible. And you can kind of, again, get the, the kind of view from space, but also the just very palpable, um, almost like the best block party you've ever been to where everyone is, is, is growing and cooking and, and celebrating um, the simplest pleasures in life, right? Of sharing food and, and sharing connection. And, and that's um, the last thing I'll, I'll say on that is, it's one in which our core human needs, this is the thrust of the Food for Climate League ethos, our core human needs of control, community and purpose, all of those are in alignment and being reflected in the broader food system that exists at that global scale. Oh, I want to come to that block party. That's for sure. I want to be part of that. Yeah, I'm uh, growing more food than ever. Um, and I've always grown food, but growing more food than ever. It's a, it's a beautiful experience. And I think that really that's, that's what we're going to see. And that overview effect, I also speak about just being an environmentalist and kind of a climate, you, you tend to touch upon that as well, you know, that spaceship Earth. I only have three questions la left for you, and, and they're really for my listeners. They're um, for them to kind of have a, a sustainable takeaway. If there was one message that you could depart to my listeners, or even two messages as a sustainable takeaway that would have the power to change their life, what would it be your message? My message is food is one of the most powerful tools that any of us has on a daily basis for individual climate action climate change can feel incredibly overwhelming it can feel distant it can feel like someone else's problem to solve um, and it can feel very in amorphous but very practically i'm not the first to say this we eat three times a day or more um, each of those is an opportunity you to feel empowered as a climate hero 
And it's not a one size fits all. There's a vast menu of ways to eat climate smart. But the big picture message is embrace the power, the agency um, of food as a tool for climate action. And so much will follow from that. What should young innovators, writers, uh, public health uh, advocates in, in your field be thinking about for ways to make a real impact? Yeah, I really think that systems thinking should become requirement of the K-12 education. The more that people see what they're doing and how it fits into the whole, transdisciplinary, again, we talk about, you know, when these things become default, you don't even need the term. Everything should be multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary. Um, food touches everything, and that's part of what I love about it. And the more that those, all the types of, of folks that you mentioned understand the whole, the interconnections, these are not linear and they're not static. Um, if everyone were a systems thinker and, and it's hard and it makes your head hurt, um, but it greatly enhances your ability to channel your time and energy towards things that are truly going to be helpful. One of my biggest gripes, I've spent a lot of time living in Silicon Valley, innovators are often designing solutions to problems that don't exist. And it's a huge waste of time and money and resources from my perspective. I just think about the possibilities of every you know, tech genius out there spend all their time instead trying to tackle climate change, how better off we would be? Uh, or any number of other, you know, racial, social issues um, related to food and everything else in, in society. So if you are in any of those positions and you can find ways to take an online class or just even look at a visual examples, what is a food system? What is a system? How do I fit into the system? How does my work fit into the system? Um, and really, Kathleen Merrigan, former USDA uh, secretary, she really points out that it's systems, plural. There is not one system. Um, and, and as you start to think about these layers, again, it can become heavy and complicating, but it can also become clarifying because you see that you have no time to waste. And the more um, the more you'll be, you'll be, as I said, channeling your time and energy towards things that are really going to make a difference. Beautiful. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Oh, that's interesting. I discovered one of my closest mentors, other than Michael Pollan, is uh, Will Rosenzweig. I'm going to just fill up your podcast with future guests. <laughs> he is a, a, a original systems thinker and founder of the Center for Responsible Business at Haas Business School, among many other things that he does. He introduced me uh, to a really fascinating construct called Ikigai, I-K-I-G-A-I. And this is a, a diagram um, that, is, that comes from Japan that is how to align these different imperatives to figure out your kind of life purpose or, or life career path. And if you just Google it um, and you will see that it is an incredibly helpful compass for figuring out how to spend your time on earth. Uh, it's really kind of this alignment of what you're good at, what the world needs, what you can get paid for. Um, and, and there's one, there's a fourth one that I'm forgetting. Um, but it just helps you see if you can figure out that intersection, you will feel challenged, proud of the, of the strengths you're bringing forward to your work. You will feel fulfilled by the purpose and mission. Um, and I sure could have used that a long, long time ago. Food systems work is very, it's hard to see the on-ramp I describe. It's not like other career paths, you know, you're, um, you're studying law and you go to law school and you become a lawyer, you study medicine and so forth. Um, it's very hard to see how do I get onto that on, that that super highway of, of food systems change. Uh, and if and if I had that diagram, and not to mention if there were more food systems curricula in colleges and universities, something I'm working hard on, uh, it would just be so much easier to see where I could fit in and and really um, try to do work that's that's meaningful to me individually, but that ultimately has the big impact that I'm looking for. 
I love that. Yeah, Ikigai, a Japanese. I, I, I've mentioned that before, but we'll also put a link where people can find that online in the show description with all your websites, your book references, and everything that we've talked about. We'll we'll do in the timestamping put in the show description, so that everybody can go and and look up and and order their books and reference manuals and to to get the empowerment that you give as such a, a wonderful person helping the world to to really become better conscious eaters. I, I really appreciate your time, Sophie, and for letting us inside of your ideas. You have wonderful ideas, and I'm expecting many more over the years, because um, I, I can tell your concern not only about your children and your family, but also for many other human beings that that we get into a better place when it comes to food and, and, and our climate and our earth. And uh, that's all I have for you, unless there's something you forgot to tell us or didn't get to get out, this would be your chance uh, before I tell you goodbye. I think you asked phenomenal questions. So it all it all came to the surface. I, I just am grateful for the opportunity to, to share this work and, and so uh, admire your leadership as well. So thank you so much, Mark. You're most welcome. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. You too. Take care.